a bill to provide for the timely consideration of all licenses, permits, and approvals required under federal law with respect to the siting, construction, expansion, or operation of any natural gas pipeline projects. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, each will control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. Thank you very much, and Mr. Chairman, I yield myself uh, such time as I may consume. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for as much time as he wishes. As chairman of the Subcommittee on Energy and Power, we've had a number of hearings over the last year, and we're all quite excited about the production, additional production of natural gas and oil in America. As many people know, we now are the number one producer of natural gas in the world and the number one producer of oil in the world. And this has come about because of the entrepreneurial spirit of the private sector and development of these properties on private lands, uh, primarily in uh, Pennsylvania, North Dakota, and Texas. So we're all excited about the opportunity for energy independence in America and certainly, hopefully, to reach a point where we're less dependent upon oil and other products coming uh, from the Middle East. I want to thank uh, Mike Pompeo, the member from Kansas, for authoring this important legislation. And although we have become the number one producer and we have an abundance of natural gas today, we still have one key problem. To put it simply, we don't have the necessary pipeline infrastructure to move natural gas from where it is produced to where it is needed most. And I would like to just illustrate how some states are being harmed. According to the Energy Information Administration in January this year, we saw several states with natural, residential natural gas prices way above the natural, national average. For example, New Hampshire was 30% above the national average. Massachusetts was 43%, Maine 67%, and Florida 68%. Unfortunately, those living in these and many other states can expect to see higher prices once again this winter, and this is precisely why we are bringing to the floor H.R. 1900. H.R. 1900 simply would bring certainty and agency accountability to the natural gas pipeline permitting process. It would allow natural gas pipelines to be built in a safe, responsible, and timely manner. It would also make existing natural gas pipelines safer. During the legislative hearing on H.R. 1900, we heard testimony from industry of a corrosive natural gas pipeline that could not be replaced in a timely manner because an agency missed the deadline to issue a permit <clears throat> by nearly a year. The American people demand better than this. And so as we hear discussion and consider amendments to H.R. 1900, I want to thank once again the members of the subcommittee, the staffs, and Representative Pompeo for all the work on this important legislation, and I would uh, respectfully reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Kentucky reserves his time. The gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. Uh, we're told that the uh, Pompeo bill seeks to speed up the approval of interstate natural gas pipelines in fact, it would have the opposite effect, delaying and disrupting a pipeline approval process that is working. The Nonpartisan Government Accountability Office has concluded that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission pipeline permitting is predictable and consistent and gets pipelines built. The pipeline companies testified that the process is generally very good and that the, quote, sector enjoys a favorable legal and regulatory framework for the approval of a new infrastructure. In short, this is a government program that works well. 
H.R. 1900 would disrupt this functioning permitting process by arbitrarily limiting the time that FERC and other agencies have to review pipeline applications. When faced with these time limits, one of two things will happen. Agencies conduct, can conduct inadequate environmental reviews and rush to approve permits that do not comply with our nation's health, safety, and environmental laws. This would be a terrible outcome because the public won't be protected and pipeline permits will be legally vulnerable. Alternatively, the agencies can deny the permits when the time limits prevent them from completing legally mandated pipeline reviews. And this would be a bad result as well because needed pipeline capacity would not get constructed. The career director at the Office of Energy Projects at FERC testified that he didn't believe that this bill would result in faster permitting. He explained that the bill would actually result in slower permitting if agencies had no choice but to deny applications because of the arbitrary deadlines established by this bill. With this bill, we will get rushed decisions and more project denials. No one benefits from that, not even, or especially not, the pipeline companies. But the problem with this bill doesn't end there. The Pompeo bill automatically grants environmental permits for a pipeline project if an agency does not make a decision on a permit within 90 days of the issuance of FERC's in environmental analysis. This provision would sacrifice public health and environmental protections in, in favor of an arbitrary deadline. And no one could explain how this provision could actually be implemented. These permits are detailed documents that include emission limits, technology or operating requirements, and conditions to ensure the environment is protected. Agencies need to figure out all of these details and then actually draft the permits. Complex permits might not even be written, but somehow they would be required to magically take effect. In an effort to cobble together a solution to the mystery of how incomplete permits could be automatically issued, the bill transforms FERC into a super permitting agency. If an agency misses the 90-day deadline, the bill apparently requires FERC to write and issue the permit itself. Under this approach, FERC will be issuing BLM rights away through federal lands. FERC will be figuring out water discharge limits. FERC will be determining which technologies should be employed to reduce air pollution emissions. FERC be, will be issuing permits to protect wetlands and even bald eagles. These are jobs that FERC doesn't have the expertise or resources to carry out. They are ordinarily conducted by other agencies. But in this bill, because of the deadline, FERC will be required to take on those responsibilities. There are going to be real environmental and safety impacts if permits automatically go into effect without the responsible agencies completing the necessary analysis. The Army Corps of Engineers and EPA raised concerns that automatic permitting could lead to permits that are inconsistent with the requirements of the Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act, and this could uh, result in harmful water or air pollution. Well, this unworkable bill won't speed up pipeline permitting, but it will have adverse health, safety, and environmental impacts. And it will undermine the public's acceptance of interstate natural gas pipelines going through their communities. That's why it's opposed by the Pipeline Safety Trust and the public interest and environmental groups. And that's why the administration has announced that it would veto this bill if it ever made it to the president's desk. This is a, a bad bill. The consequences have not been thought through, 
and I urge all members to oppose the bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. gentleman from California reserves his time. gentleman from Kentucky. At this time, I would like to yield uh, four minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo, author of this bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and, and thank you, Chairman Whitfield, Chairman Upton, for helping me work this bill uh, through our committee. It's great to have it on the floor today. Uh, we now have a bipartisan piece of legislation aimed at making simple, common-sense reforms to the natural gas pipeline permitting process. Rather than eliminating environmental regulations and permits, H.R. 1900 takes a very reasonable approach by requiring agencies involved in the permitting of natural gas pipelines simply requesting that they finish their work in a timely manner. The legislation builds off reforms made in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, which placed the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission as the lead agency for interstate natural gas pipelines. As we've heard this morning, natural gas is becoming a dominant force in the electricity generation and manufacturing uh, sectors. It's critical that pipeline construction can take place through a modernized permitting process, and that's what this bill aims to do. The current interstate natural gas pipeline permitting process established in 2005 is already in need of updating because of the enormous shale gas boom. H.R. 1900 makes changes to the interstate natural gas pipeline permitting process by simply uh, putting in place statutory deadlines for each of the permitting agencies to complete their work. This is pretty reasonable. We're simply asking agencies to do what the law requires them to do. They can say yes to a permit, they can deny the permit, but they can't sit on it. They have to do their homework. They have to get the job done. Uh, FERC is already the lead agency for coordinating environmental review of interstate natural gas pipelines. Uh, and as FERC testified in front of the Energy and Commerce Committee earlier this year, the deadlines imposed by H.R. 1900 are reasonable. In fact, FERC asked for a couple of changes to the legislation, and in each case we made those changes at their request. If an agency after H.R. 1900 were to become law, uh, an agency doesn't complete its work, the permit would automatically be approved by statute. And I've heard others say that this is unprecedented, but that's simply not the case. There are numbers of examples all throughout the federal code where statutory approvals of environmental permits are deemed approved in the absence of agency uh, saying to the contrary. You know, I, I can't imagine anyone saying that this legislation is radical or unprecedented. Uh, but more importantly, I can't see that they could claim that it is unnecessary. Uh, to my left, you can see the impact of the absence of natural gas infrastructure all across the country. Frankly, in Kansas, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, but on the East Coast, here in the Northeast where I'm standing today, and on the West Coast, you see enormously high natural gas costs, 24 percent above the national average in New York, 20 percent above the national average in Arizona, 67 percent above the national average in Maine, and 68 percent above the natural average for the cost of natural gas in the state of Florida. We're seeing these prices rise uh, because we don't have infrastructure development adequate to meet the needs of manufacturers and consumers in these places. The New York Times, that bastion of conservatism, wrote the following, saying that uh, FERC was concerned about increasing reliance on natural gas fuel generators at a time when there is increasingly tight availability of pipeline capacity to deliver natural gas from the south and the west to New England. The Boston Globe wrote, writing about pipeline projects in New England, the Globe said the projects come, quote, as New England struggles to address growing demand for natural gas and supply constraints created by tight pipeline capacity. Those constraints have led to shortages and price spikes during the peak demand periods, such as extended winter cold snaps, helping to drive the region's already high energy costs even higher. The New York Times and the Boston Globes recognize the need for H.R. 1900. This is not a manufactured crisis or a bill in search of a problem. This is a real issue with real consequences for jobs in America and for average working families all across our country. The bill will give certainty to natural gas pipeline developers that invest in projects which could transport affordable energy to consumers all across the nation. I urge my colleagues to vote in favor of H.R. 1900 and address a very real issue impacting consumers and manufacturers all across the country. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Kentucky reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. And Mr. Chairman, I yield myself one minute. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. I do that in order to respond to the concerns that have been raised about the natural gas prices in the Northeast. Uh, this is a real issue. New England is using more natural gas to generate electricity and more natural gas for he heating the homes than in the past. 
on the coldest winter days when natural gas is needed for both heating and electricity, there is more demand that, than can be met by the existing pipeline capacity. And that, of course, can result in price spikes. But this bill does nothing to solve that problem. The problem in New England isn't caused by pipeline applications taking too long to get approved by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. The problem is that the pipeline companies aren't even submitting the applications because they haven't figured out who will pay for these new pipelines. The pipeline companies haven't been satisfied that there's a sufficient year around demand. I yield myself an additional Jim 30 seconds. Jim was recognized for 30, 30 uh, seconds. Sufficient year-round demand to justify and finance these pipelines. That's an issue that FERC is actively looking at, and it's been holding stakeholder conferences about. But this has nothing to do with Mr. Pompeo's bill. Cutting corners on the permitting process isn't going to help get additional pipeline capacity built for the Northeast. I don't think we ought to be blaming government for every problem. The reality is that FERC and the government didn't create this problem. It's a, it's a problem of, uh, of, the, of the economics of it all. And the faster we understand that, the faster we can try to find real solutions. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Kentucky. This time I'd like to yield uh, two minutes to the Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Upton of Michigan. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for two minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of H.R. 1900, a common-sense bipartisan bill that's going to help build the architecture of abundance that we need to fully realize the benefits of our, of our en American energy boom. You know, you know, until a few years ago, our nation was facing a very critical shortage of natural gas. And I will remind us that policymakers in the 70s, 80s, and 90s never envisioned shale gas. Well, today, technological innovations like horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing have made the U.S. the number one gas producer nation in the world. Our overall energy landscape has changed dramatically in just a short period of time. It is not only rewriting the economic outlook that we have as a nation, but also beginning to change the geopolitical nature of global energy, as we have heard from nations around the world seeking access to United States supplies to help wean them off of regions like Russia and the Middle East. So today we face a new challenge, how to overcome government-imposed roadblocks to building the infrastructure and unleashing the innovation necessary to harness our new energy abundance. As energy production grows across the U.S., building the infrastructure to move these supplies to consumers is emerging as the real challenge of this century. With all of our abundance in natural gas, it is simply unacceptable that there are still regions of the country where lower prices are being constrained by a lack of pipelines because of regulatory delays. America's rich natural gas resources should continue fueling both job creation and economic growth, but we cannot fulfill that potential unless we ensure businesses and manufacturers have access to this affordable and reliable and clean energy. So I commend Representative Pompeo for introducing this bill, H.R. 1900, as a remedy for the problem. Setting enforceable deadlines to approve natural gas pipeline projects will build upon the bipartisan. One additional minute. I yield the gentleman one additional minute. gentleman from Michigan is recognized for one minute. Setting enforceable deadlines to improve natural gas pipeline projects will build upon the bipartisan reforms that we made with our Energy Policy Act of 2005 while preserving critical environmental review. If other nations, including Canada, Australia, and many other EU member nations can hold their agencies to real accountable deadlines, it is not unreasonable to ask ours to do the same. Congress should be doing everything possible to reduce red tape and delays in building safe and efficient natural gas pipelines to bring our infrastructure up to modern times to reflect that energy abundance. This bill is a very important step in the right direction, and I would urge my colleagues to vote yes, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky reserves, and the gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'll continue to reserve our gentleman time. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Kentucky. 
This time I would like to yield uh, three minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today I rise in strong support of H.R. 1990, the Natural Gas Pipeline Permitting Reform Act, legislation that will help bring America closer to energy independence and security. The United States is blessed with God-given natural gas resources that many experts believe exceed the reserves in places like Saudi Arabia. In eastern and southeastern Ohio, we are blessed with the Marcellus and the Utica Shell deposits that are beginning to produce never-before-seen volumes of natural gas and natural gas liquids. This part of rural Ohio, a region of the country that is often forgotten by elected officials in the capital city of Columbus and Washington, D.C., a region that sorely needs economic growth, is seeing billions of dollars of private sector investment in domestic energy production, and even more is in the planning stages. But we have a major challenge to overcome. You see, we can't always get the natural gas from the drilling site to the end users because there's a lack of pipeline networks. Pipeline companies are working 24-7 to remedy this problem, but they often face procedural roadblocks from federal agencies that slow down progress and hamper job creation. H.R. 1900 would give production companies the confidence and certainty that if they invest the millions of dollars to drill wells, they will have a way to get the natural gas to market. Now, this legislation could decide whether or not my constituents have a job. But I was disappointed that the administration is opposed to it. From the president on down, the administration has acknowledged that hydraulic fracturing is environmentally safe. Just yesterday, Secretary of State John Kerry mentioned the importance of natural gas to America. But with their opposition to this legislation, I guess they aren't really serious about America's energy independence and energy future. It seems they'd rather leave Ohio's natural gas in the ground than let all hardworking Americans benefit from its production. I urge my colleagues to support this important job-creating legislation and I urge the Senate to take it up immediately. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky Reserves. The gentleman from California. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield myself for two minutes. The gentleman's recognized for two minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, I understand that proponents of this bill want a one-size-fits-all Washington, D.C. solution to the time frames required for pipeline reviews. The problem is that there isn't some magic number of days that works for all pipelines in all circumstances. There are 10-mile pipelines far from population centers that cross no rivers. And there are pipelines hundreds of miles long that cross multiple rivers and r run through backyards. These are very different projects. It should come as no surprise that they take different amounts of time to review. When reviewing a project, FERC doesn't just have to do an environmental review. It also has to conduct an engineering review. FERC must evaluate, approve, and in many cases alter a pipeline's route to address environmental, engineering, and community concerns. FERC must determine a pipeline's tariffs and rates. Now, these are steps that take time. For longer and more complex pipelines, these steps take longer, and they should. FERC decides 92% of all pipeline applications within 12 months. Let me repeat that. 92% of all the applications are approved within 12 months. The fact is that 8% of projects take longer isn't a problem. It reflects the reality that a small number of projects are more complex and impact more people. If you have constituents in the paths of uh, these proposed pipelines, you should want the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and other agencies to protect your constituents by completing the necessary reviews. Your constituents don't want a one-size-fits-all Washington solution for all problems that are not the same. I reserve the balance of our time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Kentucky. Uh, I would recognize myself. Uh, oh, the gentleman from uh, Illinois just arrived, and I didn't see him. So at this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for uh, three minutes. 
The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I applaud my uh, colleague and fellow subcommittee chairman on the Energy and Commerce for helping bring H.R. 1900 to the floor. This legislation will help ensure the key elements of our critical infrastructure will be improved and constructed on a timely and predictable basis. This is a goal we all can and should support. On a closely related subject, I too wanted to associate myself with Chairman Whitfield's recent statement regarding the growing tendency among certain states to engage in obstructionist tactics aimed at key infrastructure projects. In some cases, states have even used federally delegated authority to block federally approved projects. Let me say that again. States have used federally delegated authority to block federally approved projects. The most prominent example is the use of the Clean Water Act to deny otherwise routine permits and approvals. As my colleague suggested, we have legislated on that issue previously, but our clear intent in doing so was frustrated in the court system. It may be well that we will need to uh, address this issue further, and I stand ready to work with my colleague to do so. In other instances, states have tried to use their authority under the Coastal Zone Management Act to impose consistency requirements on federally approved projects, even when those projects have already been found to be consistent with the state's coastal management plan. This is clearly taking a second bite at the apple. The law is abundantly clear that a state has no authority to review an existing project in a, a second time if it underwent a previous consistency review only in the event that there is an applicable program change or a significant alteration in the nature of the facility would a state ever be entitled to render a second consistency determination. For this reason, I see no need to legislate on that subject at this time, but I am well aware that even the clearest of statutory provisions can sometimes be distorted by determined states. So I will join with my colleague, Chairman Whitfield, to keep a watchful eye on this situation. Mr. Speaker, uh, once again, I support passes of H.R. 1900 and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Kentucky reserves and the gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased at this time to yield four mi minutes to a very important uh, member of the Energy Committee from the state of Florida, Ms. Castor. The gentlelady from Florida is recognized for four minutes. Thank you very much, and I thank Ranking Member Waxman for yielding the time. Uh, colleagues, we are dealing with a bill here, H.R. 1900, that relates to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. FERC is an independent agency that uh, reviews electric transmission lines that go across states, interstate electric transmission lines. They also review uh, interstate oil pipelines, and they also review the interstate natural gas pipelines. This is a very important subject. Now, this bill relates only to the natural gas uh, pipeline authority of FERC. Now, the country right now is in a natural gas revolution. Uh, it has been remarkable. The United States is now a net, a net exporter of petroleum, and it, this has happened very quickly. And FERC has responded very well over time on the expansion of the natural gas market. Uh, that's why it's so confounding of why we need this new bill that's going to short-circuit FERC's review power. Right now, uh, FERC grants over 90% of the interstate natural gas pipelines across the country. This bill really is a, a, an unnecessary piece of legislation in search of a problem. In committee, the bill was panned by the uh, FERC professional staff. The administration strongly opposes it. Instead of expediting expansion of natural gas pipelines across the country, it would disrupt FERC's natural gas permitting process, which right now is already getting thousands of miles of pipelines permitted in a timely manner. Like I said, over 90% of the applications. Instead, the bill establishes arbitrary and inflexible deadlines for FERC and other agencies to issue permits. And there are several major problems with the bill, particularly short-circuiting the permitting process for the most complex projects. Uh, it said, the bill says we have a 12-month deadline no matter what kind of project is proposed. Uh, FERC currently decides 90% of the permit applications within that 12-month period. And in July, the Pipeline Trade Association testified that FERC's existing permitting process 
is generally very good. Uh, second, in addition to this arbitrary 12-month deadline for all applications, uh, it would rush environmental reviews for complex, complex projects. The bill's rigid deadline applies to every pipeline project regardless of complexity. It doesn't make sense to apply the same 12-month deadline to, say, a 30-mile interstate pipeline that doesn't cross uh, any rivers, doesn't, doesn't have uh, environmental concerns, doesn't go through population areas, and then apply the same 12-month deadline to the most complex multi-state, interstate pipeline initiatives that goes through, goes across environmentally sensitive areas, maybe across rivers, through highly populated areas. Third, the bill also will lead to unnecessary permit denials. What we heard from FERC is that instead of speeding up the permitting process for natural gas pipelines, it is very likely that this bill will slow down permitting. If FERC can't finish its analysis by the required deadline, they may have no choice but to deny an application that otherwise could have been granted. Now, before I, I came to Congress, I, I uh, practiced environmental law. And what I learned during that time is for those complex projects, there's a lot of give and take that needs to happen. You have to, uh, you have to discuss mitigation. You have to discuss are there any alternatives. Oftentimes, these business owners, it's in their interest to have a little more time to figure out the right, uh, the right path for a pipeline or a transmission line or something like that. You get input from uh, local governments, local communities, neighborhood associations, environmental groups, and you wind up with a better project. Could I have two more minutes? I yield uh, additional two minutes to the gentlelady. The gentlelady is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman. Another serious problem with the bill is that it transforms FERC into a super, super permitting agency. Now that sounds pretty scary, but that's what it does. It says that uh, the bill provides for permits to automatically go into effect if an agency does not approve or deny them by the bill's arbitrary 90-day deadline. So FERC would be issuing Clean Air Act permits, Clean Water Act permits, even BLM right-of-way through federal land permits. These are functions that FERC does not have the expertise or resources to carry out. This is an unworkable provision that could result in permits being issued that are inconsistent with the nation's environmental laws. Finally, I know many people on both sides of the aisle are very concerned about eminent domain and the, when we give power to government to condemn lands. Well, Here's a reminder for everyone. We should all remember that when FERC issues a certificate of public convenience and necessity, it gives a pipeline company the power of eminent domain. The power to take someone's property should not be conferred without FERC taking the time it needs for thorough analysis and thoughtful decision making. So for all of those reasons, I urge opposition to the bill and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back her time. Gentleman from California Reserves, gentleman from Kentucky. I might just make one uh, comment. As the gentlelady from Florida indicated, the Obama administration has indicated their opposition to this bill. But I will tell you, we have large groups, the National Rural Electric Co-ops are supporting this bill, the Public Power Association is supporting this bill, and the New England Ratepayers Association wrote a letter to us saying, currently New England ratepayers suffer from the highest electricity rates of any other region in the country. And a significant reason for this is the limit capacity of natural gas pipeline, which the electricity generators throughout, the new, throughout new England rely on. So we're trying to respond to the needs of people, and we recognize that the economy has been weak, and uh, there's not a lot of pipelines being built right now, although there is one in my home state of Kentucky. But we want to set the framework so that when the time comes, these pipeline companies are able to move and move quickly with adequate protections. This time I'm delighted to, rep uh, to recognize the gentleman uh, from California, our distinguished uh, whip, Mr. McCarthy, for uh, three minutes. The gentleman from California is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank my colleague for recognizing me. I rise in support of H.R. 1900 in support of the work this chamber has accomplished this week. This was an important week in the House. We will have passed three bills that further the energy revolution that has propelled the U.S. to the forefront of the world's energy producers. So to hear a few of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle disparage this work, even so much as refer to it as egregious 
is disappointing. First, we passed legislation that reduced bureaucratic delays on energy products on federal lands that are providing resources to power our economy. As America, we will soon become the largest energy producer in the world. It is astonishing that this occurred while energy production on federal lands has actually decreased. We guaranteed that energy production from hydraulic fracturing on federal lands is overseen by the regulator with the best track record, the states. And today we are ensuring that one harnessed the energy resources will reach it in users in the safest, most efficient, and reliable manner. In its life cycle, the quality of life for all Americans improves. And there's no better example than at the start of this month, November 1st, the first pipeline to enter New York City in 40 years. That was 40 years that it took. What happened once it entered New York City? The price dropped. The price fell by 17%. Do you realize if you buy gas in New York City, it's cheaper than in Louisiana? But 40 years that it took, to me that was egregious. The savings that extends far beyond New York City. In 2012, affordable energy added $1,200 of disposable income to the average U.S. household. That will go to 2700 by 2020 and 3500 by 2025. That is real savings. Today we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to streamline, to protect, and to lower the cost for all Americans. They actually be able to produce and create more jobs in America. That's why you see a very diverse group of support for this legislation. From unions, to associations, to Americans. They want to keep more of what they earn, create more American jobs, and again, stop any egregious falsities that it takes 40 years to build a pipeline. I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from, gentleman from Kentucky reserves. Gentleman from California. Um, Mr. Chairman, I know of no union supporting this bill, nor do I think the Northeast ratepayers said in their letter of their, where they expressed their concern about the supplies where there's a very cold uh, time, uh, spell that they want this bill either. I'm pleased at this time to yield... Uh, three minutes to a, a, a distinguished subcommittee ranker on the energy, one of the energy subcommittees, uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko. The gentleman from New York is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Ranker, for the opportunity. The uh, bill that uh, we're addressing before the House simply does uh, not address the problems with pipeline approvals because the committee has not identified any problems with them. The natural gas pipeline approval process works well. The Government Accountability Office's recent review found that FERC's consideration of the vast majority of these projects is completed within a year of receiving a complete application. The network of over 2 million miles of gas pipelines spread across this country ensures that natural gas can be delivered where it is needed. We do have some areas where additional infrastructure is required. But the failure to fill those needs is not due to the permit approval process at FERC. It is due to economic decisions being made by those in the private sector. We do have some problems with pipelines. Accidents resulting in explosions have severely damaged property and, in some cases, claim lives. We should be doing more to prevent these accidents. The 10 percent of project approvals that are not completed within a one-year period are those that are more complex. They extend for many miles, traverse densely populated areas, and cross sensitive or valuable resources such as farmlands or water bodies. A project with these characteristics may need more than one year to ensure that the pipeline that is ultimately constructed is not going to place people, their communities, other businesses, or valuable resources at risk. Whenever a regulatory agency is poised to act under the law, to defend the health and safety of our citizens, there is a hue and cry about the necessity of doing extensive analyses of all aspects of the proposed regulation to determine its potential impact on businesses and the economy. Many of these analyses take years and delay common sense protections that will indeed save thousands of our citizens from illnesses or deaths. Apparently, protecting public health or the environment cannot wait. It can wait but the oil and gas companies cannot. We need energy, but we need other things also. 
FERC's process weighs all these considerations before approving pipelines, and that is how it should be. Pipeline projects should be evaluated in a timely fashion, but the imposition of a hard 12-month deadline for all projects, regardless of their length or complexity, is bad policy. We should devote our time to solving problems, not creating them. H.R. 1900 should be rejected. It will do nothing to improve the pipeline approval process. And with that, I yield back to my colleague, uh, Mr. Waxman. Gentleman yields back. Reserve. Gentleman from California Reserves. Gentleman from Kentucky. Uh, may I ask how much time is remaining for both sides? Gentleman from Kentucky has 12 minutes remaining. And the gentleman from California has 12 and a half minutes. Well, at this time, I would yield uh, an additional three minutes to the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo. Uh, gentleman you, from Mr. Kansas, Chairman. you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple of points I think are, are worth noting to make sure that everybody understands exactly what we're up against. There's been some suggestion that this is unnecessary. And maybe in the eyes of some in Washington, some uh, political officials, it's unnecessary. But the people who this matters to, uh, consumers, manufacturers all across the country, know that this is a necessary piece of legislation. The National Association of Manufacturers um, has said that this is something that will be important to creating manufacturing jobs for families all across the country. The Chamber of Commerce has similarly made this comment. Uh, earlier stated that um, uh, some folks were unaware of union support. Uh, for this legislation. I want to make sure that everyone's fully aware that the Labor International Union of North America, the United Association of Plumbers and Pipe Fitters, and the operating engineers have all been supportive of H.R. 1900 and the importance of energy infrastructure expanding all across our country. Uh, finally, there, there's been this idea that FERC approves 90 percent of the permits. It's been repeated time and time again. It's just factually incomplete. Right? It's like if you like your health insurance plan, you can keep it. Technically, perhaps true in the most narrow sense, uh, but in the reality, uh, it's not the case that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission approves 90 percent of all permits uh, or that they're all approved. FERC is but one of many, many agencies that has the authority to approve and deny permits. And so this 90 percent number that continues to be thrown around is just false. Uh, we don't have 90 percent of all folks seeking to build pipelines being able to build those timelines or pipelines in a timely fashion. They're being delayed. There's real demand for this. There's demand from the New England Ratepayers Association. There's demand in states like Florida, where the natural gas rates are 60 percent higher than the national average. Um, this, is a, this is a real need. This is a real challenge. And if we do this, if we get H.R. 1900 passed, um, all we're simply saying is do your job. Finish the process. If you decide that the permit shouldn't be built, any of these agencies can deny that permit being built. That seems uh, fine. We're not denying any agency the capacity to deny a permit. But do the work. Tell these folks that, no, you're not going to get it, and then allow the process to move forward. Um, these unions, these associations, these uh, real hardworking families need natural gas at an affordable price to be delivered to them, and H.R. 19 1900 will help uh, achieve that objective. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Kentucky Reserves. Gentleman from California. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield myself uh, two minutes. Gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, uh, we're not arguing whether we should have an infrastructure of pipelines to take natural gas from one place to another. That's not the issue. And that's a false premise that for some reason that may be an area of disagreement. It's not. The area of disagreement is whether in uh, letting a pipeline be built, we're going to shortchange the ability of the agencies to review the pipeline. And if we do that, there may not be time to look at BLM issues or safe water issues or clean air issues, because FERC will be told if you don't do your job within a certain period of time, this permit's going to be approved, and these other agencies aren't going to have time to do any review. Well, FERC doesn't have the ability to do other agencies' jobs, and those other agencies ought to be able to do their job, and FERC should do its job in a timely manner. But a timely manner doesn't mean a certain amount of time and no more. Not another month, not another two months, not another three months. I want to 
can close by sharing some of the comments made by others. The White House said they'll veto this bill. The president and his administration are against it. Uh, they say uh, automatic approvals of uh, natural gas pipeline permits if applications are not decided within a rigid, unworkable time frame could cause confusion and increase litigation risk. And further, the bill may actually delay projects or lead to more project denials undermining the intent of the legislation. Let's say they needed a couple more months, but that 12-month period is right there. I yield myself additional time. Gentleman's recognized for as much time as he wishes. Well, they'll, they'll either have to approve it without those extra few months of review or deny it, which could mean longer period of time before the pipeline is approved. It's counter to what the uh, proponents say they expect. The Pipeline Safety Trust and other uh, public interest organizations said about this bill, it would needlessly put at risk the well-being of the people and environment where natural gas pipelines are built, while making it easier for pipeline companies to use federal eminent domain authority to take private land without a thorough review. This is going to allow eminent, eminent uh, domain authority by a private company to take away people's land. Does that something that members of Congress want to vote for? Your constituents' land can be seized by a private company when there had not been a thorough review that would allow this kind of power over private property? That shouldn't be the result of a rushed, incomplete process. We wouldn't run a rushed, incomplete process of taking away liberty. We shouldn't allow a rushed, incomplete process to take away private property. The trust, uh, Pipeline Safety Trust also says, rushed or incomplete reviews resulting in automatic approvals pose a threat to public safety and the environment. And they characterized this bill as transforming FERC into a super permitting agency. And they said, that's bizarre. And they're right, because it effectively places control over key environmental and public health statutes in the hands of an agency primarily tasked with regulating the economics of natural gas and electricity. They don't have the expertise, they don't have the personnel, they don't have the budget, and now we're giving them that kind of a job. And the last quote I have is from the natural gas pipeline industry. Now, I realize the industry would always like the permitting to go faster. But the industry told us over and over that the existing process works well. In May, the CEO of Dominion Energy testified on behalf of the pipeline companies. He told the Subcommittee on Energy and Power, quote, the interstate natural gas pipeline sector enjoys a favorable legal and regulatory framework for the pro approval of new infrastructure, end quote. And his conclusion was that, quote, the natural gas model works, end quote. Conservatives used to say if it works, don't fix it. And yet they want to fix it with a lot of uncertain results perhaps unintended consequences. Mr. Chairman, this bill would cause a lot of problems without speeding up the permitting process, which is currently getting thousands of miles of new pipelines built in a timely manner. I urge my colleagues to oppose this uh, bill, and I reserve whatever time I have. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Kentucky. Uh, we have no further speakers, so if the gentleman would like to make his... Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, yield back the balance of our time, and we uh, recognize the right of the majority to close on the debate. The gentleman from California yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Uh, in my concluding remarks, I would simply say that the, this, this act is a common-sense reform aimed at providing greater certainty for interstate natural gas pipeline projects at a time when uh, we see great revitalization in the production of natural gas, we have an opportunity to 
uh, export some natural gas. We have the opportunity to help lower electricity rates. And I would urge uh, all the members to support H.R. Uh, 1900, and I'd yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. All time for general debate has expired. Pursuant to the rule, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. In lieu of the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Energy and Commerce printed in the bill, it shall be in order to consider as an original bill for the purpose of amendment under the five-minute rule an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee print 113-25. That amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be considered as read. No amendment to that amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be in order except those printed in House Report 113-272. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report by a member designated in the report shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. It is now in order to consider amendment number one, printed in House Report 113-272. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number one, printed in House Report number 113-272, offered by Mr. Tonko of New York. Pursuant to House Resolution 420, the gentleman from Mr. Uh, New York, Mr. Tonko, and a member opposed each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears> H.R. <throat> 1900 attempts to solve a problem that simply doesn't exist. The bill seeks to change FERC's process, even though the pipeline companies have testified that the permitting process is, and I quote, generally very good, end quote. Thousands of miles of natural gas pipelines are being approved under the current system. We have real energy challenges in this country and should be seeking real solutions to these challenges, not spending our time on problems that don't exist. My amendment addresses a real problem the dangers of climate change and the contributions of natural gas infrastructure to this growing threat. And it prevents, um, it, it prevents waste by ensuring that we use it and don't lose it. Climate change is the most urgent energy challenge that we face today. If global average temperature continues to increase, we will face even more serious impacts, including flooding of coastal cities, increased risk to our food supply, unpre unprecedented heat waves, exacerbated water security in many regions, water scarcity in many regions, increased frequency of high intensity tropical cyclones such as Hurricane Sandy and the recent super typhoon in the Philippines, and irreversible loss of the plants and animals that share this planet with us. Our behavior is driving these changes. We must take responsibility for this situation and work to halt it. We should not leave this task to our children and grandchildren and condemn them to a more uncertain and unsafe world. Many hope that natural gas or methane will serve as a critical bridge fuel as we work to reduce our carbon pollution. But natural gas poses its own challenges. Although natural gas emits less carbon dioxide when burned than coal or oil, the development and transportation of natural gas results in releases of methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas uh, which is 25 times more damaging to the climate than carbon dioxide. This is a serious concern. According to a study by the World Resources Institute, leaks from natural gas systems, and I quote, represent a significant source of global warming pollution in the United States, and end quote. The study further found that methane leaks occur at every stage of the natural gas life cycle, at the wellhead, from compression facilities, and from pipelines. These fugit these fugitive methane emissions can reduce or even negate the net climate benefits of using natural gas as a substitute for coal and oil. The good news is that we can reduce methane emissions by applying proven, cost-effective technologies throughout the natural gas system. My amendment will ensure that new pipelines incorporate designs, systems, and practices that minimize leaks, thereby conserving gas and reducing pollution. We will still need to address problems with existing infrastructure and other sources within the natural gas system, but this would be a very important start. 
it is precisely what we should expect and require of energy infrastructure that will be around for decades. By including this requirement in the law, the applicants informed before they begin their application of the requirement for this information and would have ample time to include it in permit applications. And encouraging the prevention and mon monitoring of leaks would have the added benefit of increasing pipeline safety. The language does not require an applicant to wait for the development of something new. These technologies exist today and only need to be applied to the extent applicable. This makes both economic and environmental sense. By reducing pipeline leaks, the amendment ensures that more of our domestic energy resources will be used and fewer of these resources will be wasted. The amendment doesn't fix the core problems with H.R. 1900, including the bill's arbitrary and, and harmful deadlines, but it does ensure that the bill addresses an energy problem that actually exists. If we're going to revisit the law governing the permitting of natural gas pipelines, this is the kind of common sense step that we should be discussing. With that, I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and yield back, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman yields back his time. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I rise in opposition to the amendment offered from the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko. You know, the EPA already asserts that it has authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, and methane is defined as a greenhouse gas. The EPA's new source performance standards capture GHG emissions above a certain threshold. Permits are already required for facilities whose emissions are anticipated to be above that threshold. The EPA's permitting process should be the form for this analysis and decision-making. FERC's primary role, rather, should be as an economic regulator, the same way that it is today and the same way it would be after H.R. 1900 uh, would become law. It would want to defer environmental matters uh, like this to the appropriate agency, which would be the EPA. The amendment is structured such that the determination would have to be made before the NEPA analysis would begin. In other words, when the FERC complete application is filed and FERC is put into the role of determining methane best practices rather than EPA. That puts the cart before the horse. Such decisions on methane emissions should be made as part of the EPA permitting process. Now regarding methane emissions in general, the industry has every incentive to control methane leaks. Escaping methane is escaping product, something they do not want to happen. That means losses for their business. This amendment would add unnecessary requirements to a problem that is already being addressed, and I urge my colleagues to vote no on the Tonko Amendment. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from uh, Kansas is recognized. The gentleman from New York has already yielded back his time. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. And the gentleman from Kansas yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. no. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman for, from New York. I, I ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 2, printed in House Report 113-272. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Florida seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number two, printed in House Report number 113-272, offered by Ms. Castor of Florida. Pursuant to House Resolution 420, the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor, and a member e opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Florida. Thank you. Under H.R. 1900, if an agency cannot complete its review of a gas pipeline permit application by the bill's not arbitrary 90-day, or in some cases 120-day deadline, then the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, is required to automatically issue the permit. This permitting provision uh, broadly applies to the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, and rights of way through federal lands. It simply goes too far. It's completely unreasonable. And it runs counter to the author's intent. The intent of the author is to speed interstate, the, the approval of interstate natural gas pipelines. But instead, what this provision will do, if my amendment is not adopted, is create greater delays and I believe a greater likelihood of litigation that will delay our important natural gas infrastructure in this country. 
So my amendment is straightforward. It simply strikes this provision that requires FERC to automatically issue other agencies' permits. You heard Mr. Waxman, and I said the same thing. What this bill does is it turns FERC, that's, whose jurisdiction is limited to reviewing interstate electric transmission lines, natural gas pipelines, and oil pipelines, it turns it into a super permitting agency. It goes and grabs EPA's jurisdiction and authority, uh, the Interior Department, other agencies, the Army Corps of Engineers, and, and settles into FERC this super permitting authority that really uh, is, is completely unreasonable. Uh, right now, these permits are typically detailed documents that includes safety requirements, is emission limits, technology on operating requirements, and conditions to ensure that communities are protected and the water and wetlands and other environmental resources are, are considered, when a, especially when you have a complex uh, interstate natural gas pipeline coming through your community communities. Agencies need the ability to and time to analyze all of these details and then draft appropriate permit conditions to protect our communities back home, protect the health and safety, protect landowner rights, and uh, propose cleanup requirements in case there is an accident. Under H.R. 1900, FERC acts as a super permitting agency, and if an agency cannot uh, meet the strict deadline, FERC apparently will write and issue the permit itself. This is a recipe for natural gas pipeline delays, and that's why so many are fearful of the, the uh, consequences of this bill. I mean, after all, FERC right now already grants 90% of the natural gas interstate pipeline applications that come before it. So it makes no sense to have FERC issuing permits for other agencies. FERC doesn't have the expertise to, to grant uh, land management rights of way through federal lands or to set water pollution discharge limits. That's not a workable solution. It's a recipe for greater litigation and delay. Now, besides uh, litigation and, and delays and other complications, there are going to be real environmental and safety impacts if permits automatically go into effect without the responsible agencies completing the necessary analysis. It could result in permits being issued that are inconsistent with the requirements of the nation's environmental laws. That's why the Pipeline Safety Trust and numerous environmental organizations strongly oppose the bill. The Army Corps of Engineers and EPA also express concern that automatic permitting could lead to permits that do not meet the requirements of the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. This could result in harmful water pollution and air pollution. So in, ad and in addition to delays, lawsuits, and environmental harm, automatically issuing permits without an agency confirming the legal requirements uh, is going to undermine the public's acceptance of interstate natural gas pipelines going through our communities. That's the last thing you want to happen. We are undergoing a natural gas revolution in this country that in generally is very positive. So why would, you, why would you try to pass this bill that will lead to greater litigation delays, uncertainty, and that the industry itself says may not be necessary? Agencies should act expeditiously on pipeline applications, but they also need time to conduct the necessary environmental and safety reviews. In some cases, it will take longer for a ni than a 90-day or 120-day environmental review. Some of these pipelines are very complex, and they go over hundreds of miles through environmentally sensitive areas. People need time, and the businesses need time to work through the conditions. So we should not sacrifice these protections when the pipeline pi permitting process is already working well. Nor should we take critical health, safety, environmental functions away from the agencies. My amendment doesn't fix all of the problems, but it eliminates the unworkable provisions. And if you do not want to complicate interstate natural gas pipeline process that the industry says is generally very good, uh, then I urge General you to support my amendment. Expired. Thank you. I yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from Kansas seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment from the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Gaster. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, there's been references uh, uh, that Ms. Castor presented relating to what the industry wants that says this will actually mess it up. It will make pipeline permitting take longer. Let me read from you uh, what was written in a letter to me on November 14th of this year uh, from that industry association. Uh, this is a letter from Inga signed by Mr. Santa, the president and CEO, who said the Energy Policy Act of 2005 attempted to coordinate the permitting of new natural gas pipelines by designating FERC as the lead agency 
under NEPA and granting FERC the authority to set deadlines for permitting agencies to act on pipeline actions. However, EPA 2005 did not confer upon FERC the authority to enforce such deadlines. As a result, permitting agencies routinely ignore those deadlines. It is critical that pipeline expansion keep pace with demand in such regions as New England. A clear, timely review of permits associated with proposed pipeline projects is critical to meeting these goals. The industry is full-throatedly in support of making sure that H.R. 1900 become law, and this amendment would prevent the key provisions of that from happening. Uh, we know we're seeing the skyrocketing prices. Uh, the worst residential residential price increases in the country are in the gentlewoman's home state of Florida, where natural gas is now $15.43, an MCF, 68% above the national average in the home state of the gentlelady who's offered this amendment. Part of this enormous price increase in Florida and in other states is a direct result of insufficient pipeline capacity to keep up with production and demand inside the state of Florida. And that's great. I'm glad there's demand in Florida. We now just simply need to get them affordable energy so they can continue to grow jobs for Florida families. In July of this year, the Energy and Commerce Committee held a hearing on H.R. 1900, where multiple stakeholders testified, including Nextera Energy Resources, a Florida-based energy company, which in addition to be the largest wind company in North America, is also one of the nation's largest purchasers and consumers of natural gas power for electric generation. Regarding the possibility that an agency might ultimately choose to deny an application because of H.R. 1900, something that this amendment is offered to uh, uh, make sure doesn't happen, ostensibly, Next Air stated the following in its testimony. It says, quote, In infrastructure development, a timely no is much preferable to an interminable maybe. That is, we have folks who just simply need certainty. They need answers. Uh, the gentlewoman from Florida talked about increased litigation. I am thrilled to see folks on the other side of the aisle old, finally worried about the plaintiff's bar and the excessive delays that the plaintiff's bar throws into the regulatory process. I promise my cooperation full-throatedly to work all across the aisle that, to make sure that H.R. 1900 doesn't add a single job in the plaintiff's bar anywhere in the United States of America. And finally, Ms. Castor's amendment um, was offered because they're concerned about the idea that uh, a permit would be deemed approved after a certain time, claiming in some cases that this has been unprecedented. Yet in the Clean Water Act, within 45 days of receipt and application under 33 U.S.C. 129, if no ruling has been issued, a permit, quote, shall be deemed approved. Under TOSCA in sev Section 7.5, again, uh, the company, must sub a company seeking an application must submit a notice of commencement to EPA within 30 days, after which the chemical is considered an existing chemical. That is, the request is deemed approved. Uh, this is not unprecedented. The idea that this provision is extreme is simply not supported by the facts, and the precedent for deeming uh, applications approved if a government agency fails to act is very common in our federal law. I urge my colleagues to vote no on the Castor Amendment, and with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Florida. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Florida will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 3, printed in House Report 113-272. What purpose does a gentlewoman from California seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate. Amendment number three, printed in House Report number 113-272, offered by Ms. Speer of California. Pursuant to House Resolution 420, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Speer, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, the majority earlier said that this measure is just common sense. So I have a question. Is it common sense not to consider the interests of state and local governments in allowing FERC to have this permitting process. My amendment is quite simple. The concerns of state and local communities must be considered in any natural gas pipeline permitting process and should not be disadvantaged by a permit approval process that weighs heavily in favor of the pipeline industry and could deem approved a permit that tramples the concerns of communities that are affected. Now this issue I know all too well. Three years ago, a pipeline exploded in my district. 
I don't want that to happen to any of you. But let me tell you what happened in my district. First of all, when it exploded, no one knew that there was a pipeline running in the middle of a densely populated area. The fire department didn't know, the police department didn't know, the city manager didn't know, the city council didn't know. And it took over an hour and a half for the local gas operator to go to another destination, pick up a key, come back to the community, and open the gate so they could turn off the valve. Meanwhile, what happened? There were eight lives lost in that explosion. There were 38 homes totally destroyed with just the concrete pad left. 45 other homes badly damaged. Three people were considered missing for more than two weeks because there was so little DNA left from the intense fire to positively identify them. There are people in that community today, three years later, who are still shell-shocked. And the city fathers and mothers are very concerned about making sure that pipeline safety includes notifying local communities. One of the truly frightening lessons of the San Bruno tragedy was that the many pipeline operators don't even fully know the conditions of their own pipelines. I can tell you that my communities are much more aware and engaged in natural gas pipeline safety and location decisions. The concerns and objections of state and local officials must be adequately considered and taken into account in the decision-making process on where to place potentially dangerous natural gas transmission lines. The consequences of these decisions to local communities cannot be overstated. They have a fundamental stake in these decisions on whether to permit a new pipeline project in their communities. I ask to you to support my amendment that would ensure that at the very least FERC considers and responds to local and state concerns or objections submitted as part of the FERC permit process before a natural gas pipeline permit is approved or potentially deemed approved. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentlewoman from California yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky seek recognition? Uh, I, to claim time in opposition to the amendment. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I would like to say to the gentlelady from California that all of us certainly have great sympathy and were uh, shocked by the events at, at San Bruno. I know it was a horrific uh, incident and many people lost their lives and homes and it certainly disrupted the community. I will say that in response to that accident, Congress reenacted a reauthorization of the Pipeline Safety Act in late 2011. That bill included provisions on requiring verification of maximum allowable operating pressures for pipelines constructed before 1970 and an expansion of the current pipeline integrity management program to cover more miles of pipe and therefore require uh, more inspections. The accident investigation at San Bruno determined that the natural gas pipeline that failed had been installed in the mid-1950s using incorrect materials and welding, incorrect even given the standards uh, of the day. Fortunately, that House, that, that uh, legislation passed unanimously in the House and in the Senate. And uh, I would also uh, note that under the Natural Gas Act, FERC, whether reviewing a proposed natural gas, when, when reviewing a natural gas pipeline proposed they must find that it meets the public convenience and necessity, in other words, uh, the public interest. And the Commission does uh, have mechanisms in place to listen to the concerns of landowners, of communities, and uh, they balance that with the need for ener energy infrastructure that meets national needs for a broad number of citizens. The FERC process under Section 7 of the Natural Gas Act is open, fair, and it invites participation by local communities and landowners already, and that has been in place uh, for 70 years. So uh, I think all of us understand where the gentlelady from California is coming from. Uh, we do genuinely believe that the existing process uh, certainly considers uh, local communities and the input from those communities. 
And for that, I would uh, respectfully uh, ask that we not agree to the gentlelady's uh, amendment of California, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment authored by the gentlewoman from California. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, as the noes have it, the amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I would request a recorded vote. Okay, pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from California will be postponed. It is now in order to consider the amendment number four printed in House Report 113-272. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number four printed in House Report number 113-272 offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. Pursuant to House Resolution 420, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to yield myself two minutes. I offer an amendment that responds, I believe, to the importance of the issue uh, and also the purpose of the underlying bill, and it deals with safety. My amendment delays the date upon which the bill can be implemented until such time as the federal government is no longer operating under a budget dictated by the sequester, some would call a meat axe, that is, uh, dipping into and diving into the works of the federal government, uh, such as agencies such as FERC. The likely impact of this bill, if passed, is to put FERC in a position of having to work faster, to issue decisions with fewer experienced employees, and a reduction in resources thereby Im uh, impacting safety and security, if I might say. Uh, because FERC, like virtually every other federal agency, is operating on the onerous and draconian provisions of the disastrous sequestration, which has caused so much misery and disruption across the nation and to our economy. And I might add, Mr. Chairman, the important aspect of this is that the ultimate results will be, FERC, if you don't do your work, if you're not thoughtful, if you're not deliberative, we deem the approval. There's no evidence no evidence that FERC is backlogged. This has nothing to do with the Keystone Pipeline, which procedures are in another agency altogether. And so you'd ask, what problem is this bill solving? None. Absolutely none. Uh, and uh, with a budget of $306 million because of the sequestration, $15 million reduction in spending, 5% of FERC's budget is impacted. This is a bill seeking uh, a solution uh, to a problem that does not exist, and it's dangerous dangerous to have legislation that deems approval when the agency who has jurisdiction is not completed its investigation. With that, I reserve my time. The gentlewoman from Texas reserves. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky seek recognition? Uh, to claim time in opposition, and since I'm the only one that will be speaking, I'll reserve my time until she completes uh, The her. gentleman from Kentucky reserves. The gentlewoman from Texas. May I uh, find out the time that I have? Uh, the gentlewoman has three minutes remaining. I thank the, uh, the chairman. Um, sequestration is not only impacting uh, the uh, whole of the work of FERC, but in actuality, sequestration is undermining the economy of the United States of America. In my state alone, we have lost 153,000 jobs. In the United States, they've lost one million jobs. Uh, it is so devastating that I offer to submit uh, a letter into the record from the Republican Cardinals dated November 18, 2013, calling upon the Budget Committee to rid us of the disastrous uh, sequestration. I ask unanimous consent to submit this letter into the record. Uh, that uh, the, the gentlewoman's request will be uh, covered by general leave. Thank you so very much. It indicates that we have a severe problem in sequestration. This legislation to expedite the approval uh, of needed gas pipelines uh, is, again, a initiative looking for a solution. Uh, since fiscal year 2009, FERC has completed action on 92 percent of their pipeline applications. Mr. Chairman, there is no problem. There is no backlog. Um, the idea that sequestration's impact is overstated. 
It is not true. According to an analysis conducted by regional economic models in third way, the damage to the economy caused by sequestration is substantial. And then I'd like to offer uh, a personal story uh, that deals with the impact far-reaching. Uh, the fact that pediatricians today are seeing babies that are malnutri malnourished because, because of these horrible cuts and the cuts in SNAP. Mothers are putting water in the formula. It may be a far reach, but because we are under these horrible uh, caps, uh, sequestration, it is impacting the far reaches of government. Even babies are suffering and malnourished because of sequestration. So my desire today is if this bill passes, if it even goes anywhere, uh, if it finds a problem that it's trying to solve, that it should not be implemented at all. But if it is implemented, it certainly should not burden an agency that has proven to do its work 92 percent of its time timely. It should not burden that agency uh, by insisting that it goes uh, in implementation right away. It should not be in until we have moved forward and gotten rid of sequestration. Uh, I will say in conclusion uh, that there are enormous amounts of impact, human toll impact, social safety net uh, and health education, 600,000 women and children thrown off a WIC, 807,000 fewer hospital visits for Native Americans, uh, the national security impact, uh, the U.S. less prepared for WMB incidents. So I ask my colleagues not to support the underlying bill, but to support the Jackson Lee Amendment. No action until sequestration is gone. Is I yield back. Gentlewoman's time has expired. The gentleman from Kentucky. The, the uh, gentlelady from Texas does have a reputation of being very innovative in her legislative strategy. And while I would agree with her and many of us would agree that we're frustrated with the budget process, many of us don't think the budget process works, uh, she's in this amendment trying to uh, bring to a conclusion sequestration. And I would simply say that we do not believe it's appropriate to, uh, at, nor do we think that we're equipped to debate the sequestration issue, which is a budget issue, and today we're simply trying to expedite the building of additional uh, natural gas pipelines to streamline the permitting process uh, to help people throughout America have lower electricity rates and perhaps increase our exports. So I would oppose her amendment, and with that, yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Texas. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Chairman. Yes, the gentleman. I'd like a recorded vote, the yeas and nays. Uh, pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Texas will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 5, printed in House Report 113-272. For what purpose is the does the uh, gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number five, printed in House Report number 113-272, offered by Mr. Dingell of Michigan. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read and the further reading be dispensed with. Pursuant to House Resolution 420, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingell, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Chairman, this bill is a desperate solution searching for the answers to a problem. In July of 2013, before the committee, Commissioner Mueller said that 90 percent of permit applications to FERC are already approved within 12 months, and the delays on the remaining 10 percent are due to the, either the complexity of proposed projects or incomplete applications, something which indicates there's hardly any need for the amendment. In addition to that statement, there's been no record of any backlog of permit applications that justifies the need to overhaul pipeline permitting regulations. There's an old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'm curious why it is we're trying to fix something here that is not broke. 
I'm worried that if this legislation were to somehow become law, we would already see that the agencies and the courts in their consideration would rush around to try and figure out what it was the Congress intended and how these matters could or should be, per be proceeded upon more expeditiously. That, according to the government agencies that appeared before the committee, is completely unnecessary. Having said these things, I would like to call to the attention of the colleagues here that the amendment that I offer today simply directs the GAO to take another look at the permitting process and to take into consideration these issues to tell us what it is needs to be done to better expedite the process. Why this? The reason is very simple. The committee had one day of hearing, had very little support for the legislation, no explanation of why it was needed. The, the agencies appearing before the committee said it really wasn't necessary, and other witnesses testified that it wasn't needed. Now, the report of the GAO will identify any problems which exist, and we can then use the oversight authority of the committee and the Congress to fix such problems as might be found and have an intelligent record as to what it is can or should be done to make this a step which in fact will help us move forward on pipeline permitting. Now I want to make, make it very clear. I am not opposed to natural gas pipelines, nor am I opposed to moving forward speedily and, and intelligently. The system is working. The Congress has devised a system of permitting that works, sees to it that safety is properly attended to, and has given proper oversight, including legislation recently to assure that proper behavior and proper safety of the pipelines does take place. So I urge the committee to support my amendment. It gives us a bill of which we can be proud instead of a bill about which people are going to scratch their head and wonder what was the Congress doing when they foisted this miserable thing upon us. I reserve the balance of my time. In reserves, for what purpose does the gentleman from Kansas seek recognition? I rise in opposition to the amendment from the gentleman from Michigan. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to this amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingell, which would, ex which would strike the entire piece of legislation and replace it with a GAO study. Uh, the GAO, back in February of this year, issued a report detailing what they called the complex natural gas pipeline permitting process. This amendment would simply ask the GAO to duplicate many of those same findings that were done in a report issued less than a year ago, and there's simply no need for that. I understand the gentleman from Michigan thinks this legislation is unnecessary, but I respectfully disagree. I'll give one example of where the claims regarding the approval timelines for natural gas permit pipelines uh, have been dubious. It's been erroneously repeated by opponents of this legislation that FERC testified in front of the Energy and Commerce Committee that 90 percent of the permits are being done on time. This is simply not the case. This is not what FERC stated in their testimony. It stated that 90 percent of these certificates are being completed within 12 months. There's an awful lot of difference between a certificate and a permit. FERC is in control of only the certificate process, but they're at the emergency of, they're, excuse me, they're at the mercy of other agencies with respect to the permit approval process. And this is the main reason for the need for this legislation, because FERC has absolutely no enforcement authority over the other agencies to process permits on schedule. This brings accountability to the other agencies. Even though 90 percent of the certificates are being processed by FERC in the 12-month period, it doesn't tell the full story. It'd be like talking about the bills that the House of Representatives passed and talking only about our naming of post offices and not talking about the substantive legislation, the important things we do here in the House of Representatives. I would also remind the gentleman from Michigan that the need for this legislation is so great that it garnered support not just from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers, but also the major electricity trade associations all across the country. Edison Electric Institute, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, and the American Public Power Association. 
as well as the New England Ratepayers Association, whose members are experiencing skyrocketing natural gas prices. This amendment would gut the bill and ignore the core problem of stubbornly high natural gas prices in certain regions across the nation. It dismisses the need for an improved permitting process for natural gas pipeline infrastructure completely. For that reason, I urge my colleagues to vote no on the gentleman's amendment, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Kansas reserves the gentleman from Michigan. This legislation is unnecessary. Every witness before the committee found no reason why it had to be enacted into law. It was made very clear that there have been no incidences of egregious delay by any events before the permitting authorities. There's no need for the legislation. The amendment is a friendly amendment offered to enable us to find out if there are in fact problems. And if there are in fact problems, then we will be able to take the necessary action to correct whatever problems might exist. At this particular time, there is no evidence of need for the legislation. In 90% of the time, the, the uh, permits have been granted within the one-year period. It is only necessary to allow time for others where the permitting application was incorrectly or improperly done and only where the complexity of the situation requires more time. What I'm hearing from the other side is they feel that there is need for us to move more rapidly in these complex cases where serious mistakes can be made and we can have the danger of an unsafe pipeline resulting. And I would remind my colleagues that a pipeline explosion Fired. or the failure of a gas pipeline is like a nuclear event. I urge the adoption of the amendment and the rejection of the legislation if not adopted. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Kansas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just reiterate there's an enormous support to this legislation. And while I appreciate that the gentleman from Michigan offered his amendment uh, in a friendly tone, um, it guts the legislation in its entirety. Um, I also want to offer that H.R. 1900 is offered in a friendly manner. It's offered friendly to places like Michigan and New York and Florida and Arizona, places that are paying uh, unnecessarily high prices uh, for natural gas in their parts of the country. And with that, I would uh, urge the rejection of this amendment and urge my colleagues to vote no on it. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Kansas uh, yields back the balance of his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. On this, Mr. Chairman, I request a record vote. Okay. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan will be postponed. You're doing good. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, proceedings will now resume on those amendments printed in House Report 113-272, on which further proceedings were po postponed in the following order. Amendment number 1 by Mr. Takano of New York. Amendment number 2 by Ms. Castor of Florida. Amendment number 3 by Ms. Spire of California. Amendment number 4 by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. And amendment number 5 by Mr. Dingle of Michigan. The chair will reduce to two minutes the minimum time for the electronic vote after the first vote, uh, vote in this series. The unfinished business is the request of a recorded vote on amendment number one printed in House Report 113-272 by the gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. Uh, Tonko. On um, further proceedings were postponed on which the noes prevailed by vote void. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number one printed in House Report number 113-272 offered by Mr. Tonko of New York. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of a request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a 15-minute vote. Okay. 
On this vote, the yeas are 183 and the nays are 233. The amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on amendment number two, printed in the House report, 113-272 uh, by the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number two, printed in House report number 113-272, offered by Ms. Castor of Florida. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a two-minute vote. On this vote, the yeas are 184, the nays 233. The amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on amendment number three printed in the House Report 113-272 by the gentlewoman from California, Mrs. Spear, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number three printed in House Report number 113-272 offered by Ms. Spear of California. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a two-minute vote. On this vote, the yeas are 183, the nays 236. The amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on amendment number four printed in the House Report 113-272 by the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number four printed in House Report number 113-272 offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen, a recording vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a two-minute vote. On this vote, the yeas are 170... Mr. Enyard. Mr. Enyard votes aye. On this vote, the yeas are 175, the nays are 243. The amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number five, printed in House Report 113-272 by the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingle, on which further proceedings were postponed on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number five, printed in House Report number 113-272, offered by Mr. Dingle of Michigan. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen, a recording vote, recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a two-minute vote. Let's vote the yeas are 175, the nays are 239. This amendment is not adopted. The question is on the amendment and the nature of a substitute. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Accordingly, under the rule, the committee rises.
chairman. <laughs> The chair of the Committee of the Whole House and the State of the Union reports that the committee has under consideration Bill H.R. 1900 and pursuant to House Resolution 420 reports the bill back to the House with an amendment adopted in the Committee of the Whole. Under the rule, the previous question is ordered. The question is on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of the substitute. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed will say no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question is on engrossment and the third reading of the bill. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed will say no. The ayes have it. Third reading. A bill to provide for the timely consideration of all licenses, permits, and approvals required under federal law with respect to the siting, construction, expansion, or operation of any natural gas pipeline projects. The House will be in order. Members will please take their conversations off the floor. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I have a motion to recommit at the, at the uh, desk. Is the gentleman opposed to the bill? I am in his current form. The gentleman qualifies. The clerk will report the motion. Mr. Tierney of Massachusetts moves to recommit the bill, H.R. 1900, to the Committee on Energy and Commerce with instructions to report the same back to the House forthwith with the following for what The clerk will suspend. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kansas seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I ask for a unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, colleagues, this is the final amendment to the bill. And as you know, it will not kill the bill. It will not send it back to committee. If this motion is adopted, the bill will immediately proceed to final passage as amended. And I ask you to consider doing that. Over the last several years, it's my understanding that FERC has approved 69 major natural gas pipelines. They span over 3,000 miles in 30 states with a total capacity of nearly 30 billion cubic feet per day. The Government Accountability Office, our firm that does our research for us, has found that FERC's pipeline permitting is predictable, it's consistent, and it gets pipelines built. For some reason, the underlying bill replaces that existing natural gas permitting process with a process that appears to be arbitrary, unworkable, and a one-size-fits-all approach. The bill would force regulatory agencies to comply with what many believe is an unreasonable permitting deadlines, one year for FERC and three months for other permitting agencies, to render decisions on applications no matter how complex they are and potentially before the public risks are fully understood, particularly by our local areas. If the underlying bill didn't attempt to fix an existing permitting process that many, including the Pipeline Trade Association, believe and agree is not broken, then perhaps my amendment wouldn't be necessary. Uh, if the majority had supported any of the responsible amendments that were proposed by Mr. Dingle and others here a little while ago, perhaps it wouldn't be necessary. But it is necessary. The motion states that this bill will not take effect until FERC determines its implementation will not adversely impact natural gas pipeline safety and that it will not inhibit the ability of communities to engage in the process of siting natural gas pipelines. The motion seeks to protect public safety. It seeks to ensure that our constituents continue to have a voice in the permitting process. Madam Speaker, I don't believe that that's too much to ask. It shouldn't be. So let's please do the reasonable thing. Let's stand up for safety. Let's stand up for our local constituencies and communities and support this motion. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kansas seek recognition? Uh, Madam Speaker, I claim the time in opposition to the motion. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote in opposition to the motion to recommit. Uh, while we share uh, every one of our colleagues' concerns about pipeline safety, um, nothing in this legislation uh, does anything to impact the safety of pipelines all across the country. Indeed, uh, putting in new pipelines, uh, increasing capacity for natural gas pipelines will actually allow retirement of older pipelines, which might present even more risk. 
we all know of the tragic incident that happened in San Bruno. Uh, this body has taken action to rectify that. There was pipeline safety bills passed with all the members of the House and passed in the Senate as well uh, to make sure that every pipeline built is done so in a way that is safe and responsible and with plenty of time for community input. Uh, the motion to recommit suggests that H.R. 1900 would eliminate that time. It does nothing of the nature. Uh, in every case for a complex pipeline, there will be nearly two years' time for communities and interest groups who have concerns about the pipeline going into their territory or their region uh, to make their voices heard and to make their concerns uh, registered in the public place. Um, I'd urge my colleagues to reject this motion to recommit and to pass uh, the underlying legislation, H.R. 1900. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Without objection, the previous question is ordered. The question is on the motion to recommit. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed will say no. no. The noes have it. Madam Speaker, I ask for the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Mem are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 8 and Clause 9 of Rule 20, this is a five-minute vote on the motion to recommit. will be followed by a five-minute vote on the passage of the bill if ordered. On this vote, the yeas are 180, the nays are 233. The motion is not adopted and the House will be in order. Members will please take their seats. Under Clause 5D of Rule 20, the Chair announces to the House that in light of the administration of the oath to the gentleman from Louisiana, the whole number of the House is now 432. Without objection, five-minute voting will continue. The question is on passage. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The gentleman from Speaker. California. On that, I request a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. Sufficient number having arisen. A recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device, which will be a five minute vote. The yeas are 252 and the nays are 165. The bill is passed. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table.